Hello there, welcome to the latest edition of The Front Page. There is nothing like Royal Ascot, not least until they start doing royal processions at Chepstow. And we'll be looking back across a fabulous five days at the world's greatest flat meeting in this special edition of the show. My name is Lee Mottisett and I'm joined today by Racing Post colleagues Paul Keeley, Maddie Playle and Jonathan Harding as we dig deep into those superb five days, looking at the key stories, the key winners, and occasionally the key losers as well. We will start with Mr. Ascot, Frankie de Tori. Going into the Royal Meeting, it was obvious that he was set to be one of the big themes of the week, and it was ultimately a very happy story indeed for Frankie de Tori. Picked up a nine day suspension on the first day when things didn't go right with defeats for Inspiral and Chaldean, but thereafter things got better and better, peaking with Gold Cup glory on Courage and Me on Sunday. Um, Maddie, for Frankie, it was, aside from the suspension, pretty much a perfect festival. I don't think anyone could have predicted it would be quite so successful for him, Lee. Um, as you say, the week didn't start off great when Inspiral was beaten, Chaldean was beaten, he had a whip ban that we, we were saying, oh, is it going to rule him out the coral eclipse and another big ride on Emily Upjohn? Uh, and then, as things do in racing, things just turn the tide. Uh, you spoke to his sons quite a lot throughout the <laughs> week and I quite enjoyed their input as well, sort of giving the the inside track on what he was like at home and how he yeah. was to live with and and that switch between being a grumpy man to being absolutely on it and delighted to go on holiday That's Jamie it. Spencer mentioned it after winning uh, on Cardem, didn't he? He thought he was going to be absolutely unbearable. Yeah, I think Jamie um, prefers Frankie when he's losing than when he's yeah, winning. Yeah, I don't think he'd be uh, in the in the majority in that group, no. though. It was it was great to see him on top form. And after he won uh, the Queen Mary, he was sort of bowing down, saying he's going to kiss the grass again and eat some grass that apparently he did at Epsom as well. So, yeah, it was Frankie in his element. He was absolutely loving it. Yeah, he, he, he really was. Um, and Jonathan, the... The, 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 the big motivation for Frankie going into the meeting was to get to 280 winners. He'd said that um, on the way in, that he needed three winners to get to 80. That was the figure he was, he was aiming at, and he got to 80. Mm. Um, but to win the Gold Cup as well, the race that last year had symbolised the, almost the nadir of his fortunes, with that big public fallout with John Gosden after Stradivarius' defeat, to win that race for John Gosden and Lady Gosden was pretty much perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. I think he, in himself, there was the motivation to almost end properly at Royal Ascot because his last appearance just went terribly, as you say. Yeah. You know, they, that was linked to the form of the yard, but also he had the falling out as well. He wasn't quite riding. We know, as he can, he's, he's a confidence rider. And I think it was important to him to sign off in a, in a way befitting somebody who has that sort of record at Royal Ascot and, and has that much affection from the people who, who go to Royal Ascot. So, yeah, the Gold Cup would have been a, a very special moment for him and a good way to sign off. And again, three winners for, for the Gosdens. That's significant too. Again, at this time last year, you couldn't have foreseen that there'd be three winners for the Gosdens at Royal Ascot. Or that, yeah, or, you know, you couldn't have foreseen, there was moments where we were wondering whether Frankie would ever ride for them again with the sabbatical and everything else. And ten, it was a fairly fraught situation. So it's nice that they've been able to almost put a line through it at this very same meeting where they reached rock bottom, as it were. Um, yeah, it's sometimes racing throws up these stories and there's a nice symmetry. So it was good that he signed off as he did. Keels, when, when you're tipping horses, I guess the jockey is a factor in in decisions that you make on occasions. When, when you were watching De Tori ride at Royal Ascot, were you seeing someone who in, in your head was someone who was as good as ever and also an asset to the horses he was riding? Well, yeah, he seemed to be, didn't he? I mean, you know, he's obviously, you know, won four races. He's, uh, you know, he managed to weave his way through on Courage Mon Ami. And, you know, I, I, I do think there are other, there are other uh, veteran jockeys as well who are still riding as well as ever. So I don't think there's any reason that, you know, other than he's had enough that he wants to retire. Mm. Uh, because, you know, you look at Joe Fanning's strike rate this year. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. 20, Potential champion job. 20, 24%, like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think he's, you know, he's not, you know, 
you know, none of us are as good as we were 20 years ago. Uh, talking to somebody who's a similar age as Frankie, I know that, but he's still right up there with the best of them when he's on his game. And I, I think the problem for him probably is that although he loves getting up for your Ascots and your derbies, etc., right, you have to stay fit throughout the entire season and, and, and be on the treadmill at the smaller meetings to keep yourself in the game. And I think that's what, what he doesn't want to do anymore, is it? Yeah. The I, interesting thing for me is next year, who are the bookies going to run scared of? Because there were some terrible prices about Frankie's rides throughout the week. There were some awful ones Ryan? considered. Uh, well, they never have done really. Not by the same. Not by the same stretch. They 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 fear they no Brian anyway, don't they? But I mean, some of the, some of the horses. I mean, Saga on the opening day. You know, one one out of ten hadn't won for a year and a half. Was seven oh. to two. Went off. Went off nine to one. Covey on Saturday was officially the tenth best horse in the race, even on the strength of his last time out win, yeah. uh, and was thirteen to eight at one yeah. point. Like you know, went off eleven to four. Uh, um, yeah, they just ran scared of him all week. But then on Tuesday morning, uh, I was you know, t- you know clicking away through Twitter, and the amount of people who just posted their Frankie Ackers. Yeah, you can understand why, can't you? Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, that connects to the fact as well that all throughout the week. Um, it was obvious that the public, as a group, was behind the Tory more than any other. I mean, I thought the first day is often seen as the best day's racing of the week, and it, we had some great performances. I wasn't sure the meeting really came alive. I don't think it really did until de Tory did ride that first winner on Gregory, and thereafter on Thursday and Friday, when he was successful, um, I thought the, the atmosphere was, was greater than at, than at other times. And, and it does beg the question, how big a gap is he is he going to leave? You know, you, you talk about Keels, who are, who are the um, bookmakers and punters going to side with it and ask it in, in the future? But how will how will racing, particularly this meeting, cope without Frankie de Tori? Because there is there is nobody like him. Mm. I, the, sorry. sorry, go on. I, I don't know if we saw the the clip that was circulating yesterday. It was an at the races clip where they were asking race goers at Royal Ascot to name the jockey. They're showing a picture of a jockey. So you had mm-hmm. Ryan Moore, you had Asheen Murphy, you had um, a couple of other jockeys, and the strike rate was absolutely terrible. Most of them answered Frankie de Tory for every picture. Yeah. Every single person knew who Frankie de Tory was ev- without any hesitation whatsoever. And that tells you, that's a very small sample size, of course, but there are people there who the only person in racing they know bar the king, let alone jockey or trainer, is Frankie de Tori. So that tells you the gap that it's going to leave. Yeah. I mean, there aren't many people in any sport who are irreplaceable, but de Tori is probably as close as you could get. He's he's as near as you can get, but we're going to have to get on without him because, you know, I know there's loads of people talking about, well, does he need to retire? Will he he go ahead? He's enjoyed it so much this week, but he hasn't said a word himself, has he? And it seems like he's pretty certain this is it. He's, yeah. I, I saw him the week before Ascot and he was adamant that he wasn't planning on, on changing his mind. He was also saying that he's relaxed and he's enjoying it, which it seemed to be the case at Ascot last week. And I thought it, what his eldest child, Leo, was saying was important as well. That it, He kept saying that he, he's been telling his dad, you want to finish at the top. And the Tory keeps putting out that message too. Yeah. John Gosden mm. said the same thing as well. There was no hint from John Gosden that he thought the Tory was doing the wrong thing. They keep referencing this Ronaldo um, uh, comparison of don't want to, you don't want to sort of your career to to fizzle out, and I sort of think for that reason he probably is doing the right yeah. thing. You I want mean, to leave them wanting more, don't you? Yeah, and before Ascot, of course, he'd had barely 50 rides in Britain in 2023. Yeah, so he's not been doing the hard yards in Britain. I know he raced in America in the, in, in the winter, but but uh, you know he hasn't had that many rides, has he? So mm. he's winding down for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we won't have Frankie de Tori at Royal Ascot in 2024. Actually, we will have him for a bit longer than we thought because he said today, Jonathan, that he's now going to ride at the Melbourne Cup Carnival. So he won't be finishing at the, the Breeders' Cup. Not quite sure where he'll finish, whether that be in Melbourne or Japan or Hong Kong or somewhere else on the international circuit, but he's going to go for a bit longer than we thought. Yeah, this was the Victoria Racing Club uh, sent a release out just before we came on on Monday morning saying that it's confirmed that Frank is always going to take rides at the Melbourne Cup Carnival, that obviously being the, one of the final pieces of the puzzle for him, really. It'll be the 30th anniversary of his first ride there, and he somehow hasn't won it yet. It's one of the very few races globally. So, yeah, he's kept his um, sort of globetrotting element of his 
retirement tour fairly open-ended because I imagine there's a few more stops to come and a few places you'd like to tick off the bucket list but the Melbourne Cup would be certainly the biggest thing that he would like to win still that's the one unanswered thing for him so interesting to see who he rides now. Yeah and we will be looking at maybe a potential Melbourne Cup winner in the second chunk of the program but before we do we have a fabulous offer for the Racing Post Members Club. Okay, welcome back to part two of this week's Royal Ascot recap edition of the front page. We're now going to look at the top equine performances. Um, Keel's going to shout out a few names here. Mosterdaff, Triple Time, Paddington, Karaj Manani, Shaquille Tahira, uh, Piledriver, Kadeem, um, some of the big group race winners. Which ones for you? stood out. Which horses produced for you the defining performances of Royal Ascot? Uh, well, the ones I really liked. I mean, Mosterdaff was really, really good. And it's, it's, it's one of those, in hindsight, the one that got away as well. Cause he really? Because he was 25 to 1. Well, if you looked at the official figures, he was uh, there was five horses in the race. Yeah. So it was a six-runner race, but five of them were within two pounds of each other. He was level with, uh, I can't remember who it was now, but he was level with two of them, and one pound behind one and right. two pound by, behind Luxembourg. And, of course, his best form worldwide is just absolutely right up there that's yeah. what that's why he was rated as he was yeah. now i'm not 100 percent sure i believe the figure we've given him just simply because charlie appleby was out of form the market told you that my prospero uh was going to run how he did and Bay Bridge ran a shocker uh Bay Bridge ran a shocker or you know a day or so he's left to beat luxembourg who i've never thought was a a real, real top notcher. Okay. Uh, might be a little bit wrong then, but obviously he's won very easily. We'll have to wait and see. He's going to end up being pretty short based on what he's done then. And you know, my head's thinking, I'm going to take him on somewhere. Like, you know, but uh, I loved one you haven't mentioned. I loved King of Steel. Go on. Mm. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. He didn't half move well for such a big horse, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Travels beautifully. Now, you know, he was a horse. I thought this is a guaranteed blowout material as well. Having Did you? Had such a hard race at Epsom, having come back, you know, within three weeks, and you know, last year he ran once, and then ten days later he blew out completely in the Futurity, yeah. and it turns out he's miles better than all bar the winner. Uh, but he came through there and he just cruised alongside him. He looks like a Shire horse compared to the rest as well. He's so they big, won't put on the marketing out there. No, <laughs> <a stallion. laughs> no, but you know the, the size of him, and you know Roger Varian's obviously got a very, very good horse. Be interesting to see or what happens with him and August Rodin. What would happen? Do you think? I mean, they're not going to meet for a while because he's going to go for a Grand Prix de Paris, August Rodin Irish Derby. But say they met in a King George down the line, say or something like King that. Say they met in a King George. Uh, it'd be interesting price-wise because August Rodin, if the, yeah, assuming they both win there next time I was reading it's still going to be a warm fav mm. uh, I'd have thought but I, th I might be tempted would you I might be tempted we'll have to see we'll have to see how they go and the other one um, Shaquille I mean yeah. great story now I, I do I do think um, little big bear was holding a bit back for himself to be do honest. you really yeah okay yeah I do but to Mr. Brake now, the one thing about him he, he reared in the stalls but he actually landed running okay. but he still lost a few lengths like, but to miss the break and come through, he must be a very good sprinter to be able to do that because the pace held up as well. Mm. Uh, because um, Little Big Bear and Swing Along were effectively in the first two all the way. Yeah. And when the pace holds up and you come in from seven, eight lengths behind, you're a very good horse, aren't you? So I said going forward through the season, obviously he'll be campaigning Group 1 sprints now. Well, it's sick of, there's nothing that's sick of me. I tried to make excuses for Noble Style in that car, and I was yeah. like, just, well, hang on a minute, here's a horse that's won it quite easily, why don't you just believe the form? And if you'd have believed the form, uh, you've got a horse that's a much bigger price than it should have been. Well, you know, it's another yeah. another mistake I made of the many well, well, <laughs> I made mistake. last week. So um, in, in a Group 1 head-to-head -head between Shaquille and, I don't know, Kadeem, You'd be keen to be on Shaquille. Oh, Surely Kadeem can't win a second group. It's, one it's just like you know, this is that that that, that um, how that how, race, how that race is purely the Jamie Spencer straight track at Ascot factors. First time he'd ever ridden yours. Yeah. 
Uh, and I, I swear I've backed Credit Card. It's Cardem, isn't it? Is it? Okay. I think it's Cardem. But I, I've backed him at least twice with Group 1s a couple of years ago. Yeah. Thinking, you know, this is a fast ground. I'm sure I backed him. I'm sure I tipped him back to Village July Cup a couple of years ago. And uh, there's so much form in the book that says he can't do that. But Jamie Spencer gets on him mm. uh, at Ascot. Just, he just rides that course so well. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? He's just, yeah. it's straight, it's, his record on the straight course, big field handicaps. He's won four Britannias, four Sandringhams. Uh, you know, he's just. Only won a handicap yeah, during the week yeah, on the straight course. Was, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's just, a, he's just amazing. So. Just going back to Mostadaf, um, Maddie, Keels was highlighting the, the questionable aspects of the form. Um, did you believe what you saw with him? Um, I think I questioned it a little bit, to be honest. Um, the form was in the book, and we should mention Equinox, who of course won yesterday, oh. and it was a boost for, for that form in the Shima Classic. Yeah. Um, but I'd be with Keels in that I think some of the key protagonists didn't produce their best, so they are... Uh, Baybridge, even my Prospero perhaps, um, but take nothing away from Mostadaf, he was very, very good. Interestingly, uh, talking about King of Steel, um, I was reporting on that race and the aftermath was quite fascinating because you could sense that this was a really high pressure moment for the whole team involved yeah. and um, stupidly I asked Kevin Stott, is this the best middle distance horse you've rode? And he sort of went, yes and I went by a long way and he went yes and I should have said is he just the best horse you've ridden because I'm pretty sure he is um, but you could tell that even though he was a big price for the derby they were expecting a massive run there yeah. and he was still sort of going back to that and saying oh well if he would have run in the Dante maybe we would have won the derby there's a real sense of what could have been and this was the release of all that emotion um, huge performance to to be far back off what didn't look a great strong pace early on and swoop with that devastating turn of foot he's got. Uh, he's such an exciting horse. And actually won a two boost for the Derby form during the week with Waipiro winning the um, Hampton Court I was well. going to mention him as well. He's one of my favourite horses. I really love this horse. Um, followed him all the way through and he was dominant, wasn't he, mm. in the Hampton Court? They seem to think that 10 furlongs is his trip. Uh, I think there's more big prizes to be won with him. Let's hope we can keep him in this country for a bit longer. Uh, his owner, obviously, Hong Kong based. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, Group 1 Milers, we had triple time on the Neil Callan in the mm. Queen Anne Stakes. Paddington, awesome, I thought, in St James' Palace. Tahira, maybe not quite as visually stunning in the, in the Coronation Stakes. Um, How do you rate those? I mean, Tahira was clearly entitled to win. I'm just disappointed that Morge didn't turn up. Mm. And I mean, that, that you talk about Godolphin having a bad week. I think Morge not turning up was the, the worst possible part of all of that because we really wanted to see those two take each other on. I mean, triple time was a fantastic training performance. I don't know, we need to start taking, paying a lot more attention to Kevin Ryan's horses, because when he has a good one, he, he knows how to prepare him for yeah. these big days brilliantly. And Paddington, very good horse, wins very good race. I mean, he's going to be incredibly difficult to beat, I think. I think he's the, probably the, him and Mostadaf for me, and Shaquille would be the three standouts going forward. Maddie, Paddington the best martyr in town? Perhaps not yet. I okay. think what Triple Time did, considering he was so keen early on, uh, you can upgrade that performance. And I think he could have beat higher quality opposition in the Queen Anne. Um, not quite buying the hype just yet, but I do think he's a hugely improved horse. What about you, Kills? Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I, thought, I thought he was very good. I question the actual form of the UK Guineas. I don't think that's all that good. I, don't know, but I should have been quick. If I'd have questioned it a bit earlier, it might have saved me a few quid as well. <laughs> but uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so he's, he's top of the three-year-old Paul Colts. I did like to hear her because they went really slow did there you? and she still okay. swung around and quick and passed them. And I think, uh, I do think she's very useful, but it sounds like that she's going to end up going up in trip. Uh, and obviously there's loads of stamina uh, in that pedigree. So, uh, it's interesting because to watch her, you would not say this is a horse you know, who wants think further. You'd, you'd think you go down to seven quite comfortably, yeah. wouldn't you? But but you know, but David Well was talking about it, and now she's going to have a break anyway. Mm. Uh, so interesting to see what all the targets there are. One of the but if she back came back, back, if she came back here, let's, let's say she came back to the QE two and it was easy ground, I think I'd be wanting to back her more than anything else. I wonder if they'd be working back from the Philly Mare turf at Santa Anita, given that. The, um, 
they've had some success there, haven't they, at that meeting mm -hmm. um, with Tanar and others. I just wonder if that Maybe, might be. Maybe, yeah. Um, pile driver. How can you, your face lit up the mention of pile driver? He was he was wonderful on Saturday. He was so brilliant. Um, I mentioned it in my report that there were cheers at when he hit the front, and then again when the um, announcement that he'd keep the race uh, came through. I I just love this horse. I think a lot of people have the same view. You know, William Moore, he's he's such a <laughs> funny guy. And he was sort of saying afterwards, he thought he had a heart attack half an hour before, but it was actually just indigestion. <laughs> and then when we were waiting for the um, steward's inquiry, he was like, it's all right, I'll go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> so, yeah, he was very cold on him beforehand, actually. Um, usually a very bullish trainer, but he was saying, you know, he's not fully ready he'll come on for this whatever he does he'll improve um yet when pile driver hit the front he went for a closer look at ascot's winning post it's a winning post he knows it's, pretty well at this it, point it's funny isn't it? i think that's a little <laughs> bit nerves coming in as well though because um we had david jennings um uh, the other day was saying that you know he, he'd um spoken to william muir and he said um he's gonna he, he's gonna come on a lot for the run and then he'd say but he's working better than he's ever worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, PJ McDonald was asked we as all, well, we and he like, said he looked good. We all like, there's, there's loads of reasons to like Pile Driver, um, not, least, not least connections, because it's yeah. not connections you associate Absolutely. with having big winners all the time. But yeah, another one is he's, he's extremely good and yeah. he's quirky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? And he and doesn't. Around he runs around race. a little bit, but yeah. he still runs forward at the same time, he does, doesn't he? Yeah. But, you know, and that's it. He's now one of King Edward VII, he's now one of Harbick, he's now one of King George. Unbeaten uh, over a mile and a half. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. So he, he loves it around there. He was ludicrously keen yeah. as well. And I thought to myself, oh, no. You know, and, you know, I love him extra specially because. Uh, of all the horses I tipped, he's the only one who managed to get his head in front. So he was carrying, <laughs> he was carrying an awful lot of extra weight for me, and still did it. Do you foresee you'll be tipping him in the King George as well? Uh, I eight to one don't ish, know. I, heard. I, uh, I don't know, but it's it's quite possible. Yeah, it absolutely. is quite possible. Why does he? But the only thing is that last year's last King George, they went off obviously ludicrously fast, and he was able to yeah. just to swing by them all. But you know. He can he can win a slower run race while tugging like mad. He can still pick up at the end. He's just a very good horse. Any um, any tier up performances that particularly stood out to you guys? I'm, I'm going to say no. I don't really? think they were an absolute. I mean, obviously the Coventry is probably the best race. River Tiber. Yeah. Uh, and River Tiber, you know, although he started over five, he's you know he's not even a six furlong horse, is he? He's going to stay yeah. further. The one filly I really liked was the, the runner up in the Albury, uh, Matrika. Yeah, I thought she was drawn right over the far side. Uh, it was easily the lowest draw of finishing the first uh, for, to finish up there, and I just think she, she's going to have an awful lot more to come. And of course, they had pearls and rubies have been favourite for the Albany uh, yeah. for a while. Uh, and they decided to switch her to the Cheshire. So they were, obviously she had been showing an awful lot uh, to be running in that. And I think she'll end up the best of those fillies. Yeah, she only just touched off, wasn't she? Um, in terms of handicaps, I mean, from my perspective, Vauban was the one that stood out. Um, Willie Mullins and Rich Ritchie were saying after the 2022 triumph hurdle that the plan was the 2023 Melbourne Cup or a future Melbourne Cup. Um, he absolutely hosed up. And again, they weren't afraid to say straight afterwards the Melbourne Cup is the plan. He has to pass the ballot clause um, yet, so he needs to get a win or get place in a group contest or uh, EVE or something like that. <coughs> but if he does pass that clause, although he will have gone up in the weight, he looks like an ideal type for the race. And he just roll along and must have a big chance, mustn't he? Yes, I think so. And um, the only thing I'd be concerned about with him is uh, you watch the copper horse back and yeah. Ryan Moore pushed him on nice and early brilliant ride from Ryan as yeah. it was all week but coming around the home bend and even beforehand he was really keen to extract this horse's stamina will he be able to lie up on lightning quick ground in a Melbourne Cup in the very early stages if they don't go too quickly yeah of course he will be able to but I do wonder whether the tactical pace we often see our good mile and a half horses you know run well in that race yeah. so will he be found out on that front but yeah, I mean, he looks. To have I don't think. I, I don't think. He, I don't think he needs to make. He certainly doesn't need to make the run in though. That's the, that's the thing no. about the horse because he spent his entire life being, you know, off the pace in uh, over yeah. hurdles and all that. And it was especially yeah. impressive when, when he when he won that triumph. 
I just think Ryan Moore thought, well, I've got so I can get such an easy lead here, and everyone's just going to sit behind me. And you see how how slow they went there compared to some of the races earlier in the week. I mean, that's um, obviously one mile six, uh, but from the 11 pole to the 10 pole, we ran 12 and a half seconds. Now you take the you take the three-year-old mile and a half handicap. Oh my God, that was. Um, never seen him go so fast. They were Every the single horse in that race ran from the 11 to the 10 faster than 11 seconds. It was like the Grundy and King went, George. David Dio went 10.22. <laughs> it's about as suicidal as you can get. Yeah. And if you want to look at horses, uh, there were three that were fairly up with a pace that didn't fall out of the back of the TV. Yeah. And they were Perfuse, Tagabawa, and the one I like particularly is Wonder Legend, who was still swinging off the yeah. bit, turning for home, yeah. despite having you know, I've been third or fourth most of the way round. That is a very, very, very well handicapped horse. And Connection said afterwards, uh, would have preferred a softer surface. I think that's nonsense. He just went through it fine. They were just trying to make an excuse for why he didn't go for it. And the excuse is that they went ludicrously hard. So some names to remember there going forward. Uh, time to tell you now about a free bets offer. Welcome back to the front page. Paul Keeley, Maddie Plough, Jonathan Harding joining myself, Lee Mossad, as we look back at Royal Ascot. And now we're going to be focusing on who were the big winners of the Royal Meeting. Not necessarily the best equine performances, we've done that already, but the best, the real, the real winners. Um, and um, going into the Royal Meeting, Jonathan, um, one of the things that I've been speaking about was thought the, the, the likely big things were going to be Frank de Tory and potentially the king, in the sense it was his first Royal Ascot. The vibes were that he would attend all five days, which he did. More than that, the king and the queen had a winner on Thursday with, with Desert Hero. And it looked like he was very engaged. As we've said before, the queen's role in horse racing was hugely important, not just as a head of state, but also as a, um, a commercial draw for horse racing, like in terms of sponsorship and inward investment. For racing PLC, it seemed to me that this was a big win last week, or am I being naively optimistic? No, I think, I think you're right. I'd certainly side with you that it was a big win. I think there's, there might be some people who feel maybe it's overplayed, maybe it's a little bit sort of gushy about, yeah. well, the king is that we've had a royal winner and it's so important that we have their patronage, but I really don't think you can underplay it. Um, the image of him looking down as his horse won was on the front of mm. national newspapers and racing needs its needs its way into the mainstream and Frankie de Tory and the Royals historically have, have done a fantastic job of getting racing into that wider consciousness at a time when there are threats that didn't materialize last week but from fairly niche fringe groups the idea that this is a sport enjoyed by the Royals by the King that has his patronage is in, is hugely important from a public popularity point of view yeah. and the fact that he was there a suggestion that he was perhaps there out of some duty to the late Queen I, I'm sure there was an element of that but it seemed to me as though and a, quite a telling interview with Zara Tyndall yeah. afterwards yeah. it seemed to me as though they are engaged they visited Newmarket they are continuing to um, be involved in the sport, not just involved in the sport, sorry, but to enjoy the sport as well. And as a draw, they are as big as it gets at the Royal Meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Maddie, it wasn't just the King and Queen who had their first Royal Ascot winners as potentially significant owners in the sport. Um, Ammo Racing, they broke the duck um, and then followed up with King of Steel on the Friday. And Wathnan, Wathnan Racing, uh, an operation that we hadn't heard of until relatively recently, headed up by the Emir of um, Qatar, had two Royal Ascot winners headed by Karaj Manami in the Gold Cup. Again, significant successes. Yeah, and I think Peter Scargill um, wrote about this and the sort of soft power that yeah. racing has in the, in the global um, environment, really. And, and um, I think that's a real key thing theme that we saw played out at Royal Ascot you know you've got um, incredibly powerful people all coming together 
um, on this one global stage and and that's sort of a brilliant aspect of, of the sport is that these links are, are played out on the turf almost as well as you know the the influence that they can have elsewhere and I think for me both that and then the complete opposite um, was a real great thing to see at Royal Ascot you know we talk about um, trainers like Julie Camacho like Mick Appleby yeah. um, like Pat Owens had a third in the chest yeah. he was absolutely yeah. delighted uh, so many others you know you still have a chance at these meetings even if you're not an Aidan O'Brien or a John Gosden, which I think was brilliant to see. And Keels, Archie Watson, three. I mean, you, you wouldn't have predicted going into Royal Ascot, and he wouldn't no. have predicted well, going into Royal Ascot. He'd, he'd only had three two, winners. two winners, I think, previously at Royal Ascot. So he ends up with three, and it was very, very nearly four, because Army the Ethos was, was yeah. a neck uh, down in, in, in second. And of course, all written by Holly Doyle. Absolutely. Which is great. I mean, she, you know. I mean, she's potentially one of the uh, jockeys that people might latch onto mm -hmm. in the future because, yeah. you know, for, for good reason, everyone loves Holly Doyle. And she's, you know, she's just won a, a, a classic in Germany as well, yeah. coming into it. And she comes over here and uh, rides three winners. And, um, yeah, Archie Watson, we know how good he is. We know how good he is with sprinters, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just referencing Holly Doyle again, um, Hayley Turner, yet again a Royal Ascot winner. She's a bit like Jamie Spencer. She's so good on that straight course yeah. at Royal Ascot. For Sa Harry Eustace, a very up-and-coming trainer. Yeah. Um, Safi Osborne almost rode a winner in the Duke of Cambridge Stakes. Again, a few years ago, the idea that you could have had so much success from female jockeys at Royal Ascot just wouldn't have been um, feasible. But now, we're mentioning it here, but it didn't really get mentioned during yeah. it because you don't have to mention it, no. but just because they're, well, you they're top it. jockeys. You expect it. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, and also just referencing um, people who had a successful Royal Ascot, not a surprise, but Aidan O'Brien, again, top the trainer standings, just edged out John and Thady Gosden on that one, but again, significantly, we spoke about Tatori wanting to get to 80 Royal Ascot winners. For Aidan O'Brien, the key thing was he went past Sir Michael Stout and became the most successful trainer in Royal Ascot history. And when you consider his age, he could go miles clear. Well, he's going to set a benchmark that will never be beaten, isn't he? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you, you always say never, say never, don't you? But it's going it's to take somebody to start training when they're 14 and still be going when they're 100, the way Aidan O'Brien's been doing it, well, isn't it? Well, both of his sons you know had winners I mean? last week. Well, yeah, so yeah, yeah absolutely. The they've, got, they've got a hell of a long way to go, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, they easily have another 30 years in Aidan yeah. O'Brien, can't he? And I think after that Albany stakes that Frankie won for Donna Craig Bryan, there wasn't an O'Brien in the winner's enclosure at Asker that Frankie Latore didn't hug and embrace. They were, they were all there, all part of the party. Um, one more segment to go. Before that, how would you fancy a free holiday at Santronita to watch the Breeders' Cup? You would? Here's how. Sadly, Racing Post staff cannot enter um, that competition. You all can. We have spoken about the winners from Royal Ascot 2023. Obviously, where there is success for some, there is the opposite. And not everyone had a great um, Royal Ascot. Um, the one that's maybe been referenced most, um, Jonathan Godolphin, Charlie Appleby. Yes. Um, we spoke about Morge not running in the Coronation Stakes which was a big disappointment, but it was the first time in many years that Godolphin had ended the meeting without a success. In recent years, Charlie Appleby has been a consistent winner. This was a, I'm sure it's nothing more than a blip, but it was still a disappointing one for them. Yeah, I think it's just reading here, Godolphin without a winner for the first time since 2006, mm -hmm. which is testament to, I mean, just how consistent they've been. But like you say, these things do tend to ebb and flow. What I would say is, just to be going back to Aidan O'Brien, testament to when he has a bad week, they're still, I don't think uh, Coolmore and Aidan O'Brien quite have the same swings of low to high. I think they, they can be quite middling and then have very good weeks like they did this week. 
but Godolphin, I mean, it just, they didn't really feature at all. I don't, they, you never really felt like we were going to be speaking to Charlie Appleby last week. I'm sure it's only a blip. Um, I think the form going into it was concerning enough anyway. Um, but I, I've no doubt that they'll bounce back from that. It just seemed to be one of those. I think you can possibly, my view would be, you might be able to mark up Adair given the general form of Appleby and Godolphin. I think his run might turn out to be slightly um, better. You might be able to mark that up. Do you both agree with that? Yeah, I can see that. I, I question whether they're desperate to win a one mile two furlong race without yeah. Adair. I just question whether he's actually quick enough now, having yeah. seen that. I mean, As you know, yeah, it's worth, well. worth giving another go, maybe, but oh, what did he have? 18 runners, three thirds? Yeah. And that was it. I mean, it's a terrible return for a stable, so big, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But as Jonathan said, you know, the writing was almost on the wall going into the meeting because mm -hmm. it was very quiet. I tried to convince myself that it wasn't because I backed a few. Yeah. Um, but no, they didn't. You know, there was something not quite there. I mean, they're not, they're not really sick or anything because a few of them have run okay, but um, there's something missing there at the moment. I was speaking to someone in the press room actually, and they were arguing that they just didn't have that many outstanding horses um, in races like the, the sprints and the jersey and they had horses who were coming off disappointing efforts last time or horses that just weren't good enough so maybe that's one side of it. Um, other people who didn't maybe have the Royal Ascot they would have hoped for, Wesley Ward. Um, Maddie, you were following internationals going into to Royal Ascot, particularly I suppose the Australians because you were at Ascot that gallop yeah. this morning. Um, the Australians didn't have a a great Royal Ascot this year with with Cool and Gatter and Artorias, the the two big names we're into meeting, not not really getting close to, to winning. But but Wesley Ward again had a, a Royal Ascot, a bad Royal Ascot with his runners not even sighted. They ran appallingly. Yeah, I think the the number one disappointment was American Rascal in the Norfolk, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so disappointing. Um, whether you can say you know the draw pay, played a part, I'm I'm not sure because they seemed to come from anywhere last week. Um, he was their number one hope. I think Wesley was positive about some of his other runners. I spoke to him about Bunchton, uh, won the Phillies he was running, and he was confident, as he always is, but I feel like that was his number one hope, and he was just absolutely deplorable. And then in terms of the Australians, well, I think Cannonball uh, unseating the rider in the Jubilee was pretty much um, a sign of their week, really. Artorias ran a pretty good race in, in the same race, but... It just didn't work out um, and I think that the success of George Weaver um, in Crimson The Advocate. Queen Mary with Crimson Advocate, yeah, I was really delighted to see that because international success breeds international success. We want people yeah. to be successful yeah. so that they come back and um, it wasn't to be for the Australians, it wasn't to be for Wesley Ward, but they will come back and they will hopefully return stronger than ever next year. Kiel, so has the time gone now when um, punters will automatically just look at a Wesley Ward two-year-old. Yeah, I, I think, think that's long that gone. I think that was going. I think that was going anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, as a as a selfish punter, I wish they weren't here in the first place because it, it takes away that unknown. Right. Uh, as an actual uh, racing fan, I'm glad they all come over. But when yeah. it comes to the two-year-old races, I want to give them a miss because. You know, and I'm sure there are lots of people who are like that because well, how do you know? You see this yeah. horse, uh, American Rascal, go and win by 11 lengths or whatever and a ridiculously fast time in America. How does that equate to what we've got over here? Yeah. And we've got no idea. But yeah. You know what I mean? And it makes it hard, it makes it hard to have a bet. Um, good, well, good week for at least one American trainer, George Weaver, winning the, the Queen Mary Jonathan. Um, in that race, you had uh, John Velasquez, the winning jockey. You had Javier Castellano. Yeah, Joel Rosario, we would have had Irad Ortiz had he not gone down with food poisoning. I mean, for, for Ascot, that's significant to get riding talent like that in, in one race just underlines how Ascot has become a real international meeting. Yeah, it's significant, but not that surprising having, you know, and you yourself would have spoken a, a few times to Nick Smith about the efforts that they do. It's not that these people just turn up. It's no. They're very proactively sought out and just on the international note, a lot of Americans coming over, a lot of Australians. I think we've touched on this before in the paper. The next one needs to be, can we get a few more Japanese runners over at Royal Ascot? Because I'd love to see them take on some of our best. Yeah. Kills? Yeah, you'd like to see more of them though, wouldn't you? But because of Brexit, they're not, you, they cannot ride for other stables unless they have a visa over here now. 
uh, Adrian Bowman told us that the other the other day at the London Racing Club, didn't he? So none of, none of the Yanks can ride their own trainers' horses, but they can't come on and get a ride for Aidan O'Brien or whatever. They have to get a visa sorted for it. seems so unfair given James McDonald was riding for all different kinds of trainers last week. Wasn't a great week for him, actually. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, I backed, a f I backed a few of them. I think he was unlucky a couple of times, but... Um, you know he's a he's a very very good jockey. He was unlucky on one of the ones I, I backed. I can't remember which one it was now, but uh, uh, yeah, it's just a case of getting a run sometimes, isn't it? He, there's, a, there's a horse that finished fifth, and I can't remember. Was it was a, no, it was in the uh, Phillies Kensington Palace handicap that should have won, but I can't remember the name of it now. But anyway, that was just it was just an unlucky in running. And while talking about unlucky, just to, to finish off, um, Rab Havlin guy did nothing wrong. But he had ridden Gregory in both that horse's two mm. previous outings because Frank Dettori doesn't tend to ride the horses owned by Philippa Cooper. Rab Havlin does. Of course, that horse was sold to Wathnan. Frankie gets on board. Rab Havlin ridden Courage Mon Ami in all mm. three of his previous starts and might well have ridden him again had Hascoy not been retired prior to the Gold Cup, meaning Frankie got on on um, on that one. So again, no slur on on, on Rab Havlin, but he probably no, you imagine it's, got to the mid thought, my God, what could have been? One of those jockeys, a bit like Willie Ryan years ago, for being the, the understudy. Yeah. For being a constant understudy, and you know he's a cracking rider, but he must be sitting there thinking, well, I wonder who's going to get the job now yeah. <laughs> when, mm. when, when when Frankie disappears. Yeah. Because um, you got the ride on Queen for you, still owned by Philippa Cooper, but yeah. she couldn't do the business in the coronation. No, no. But in 2024, Rab Havlin can take consolation that Frankie Tory will probably be on the ITV podium talking about Royal Ascot, not taking horses that Rab Havlin has ridden in the past. That then was Royal Ascot 2023. Are we all happy that it was a good one? Fantastic. I thought it was absolutely wonderful week. Yeah. Jonathan, you agree? Yeah, apart from being a puddle by the end of the day in the press room because of the heat, <laughs> oh. it was, um, yeah, great. For, for on, the, on the track, brilliant. Great stories, everything we could hope for. And Kiel, aside from the ponting. Yes, yeah, aside from the ponting, financially not very good to, to say that to say the least. But as a spectacle, yeah, it's always great. Yeah, wasn't it just? Okay, that then was our Royal Ascot review program. We will be back next week on Monday to discuss the major racing stories on the front page. Until then, with thanks to Paul, Maddie, and Jonathan. Bye bye.